Good morning and welcome to worship. Greetings from the Matson family. We are so thankful that you are here worshiping with us today and we can't wait until we get to see you again soon. Good morning and welcome to online worship with Wesley Church. We are a United Methodist community based in Springfield, Missouri. And whether you're part of our Wesley family, a returning visitor, or this is your first time, we're so excited to worship with you this morning. Starting next week, we are inviting you to spend two weeks intentionally focusing on how to share Christ's love in our community. The staff at Wesley has created a care card to make it even more fun. And when you complete at least 15 on the care card at the end of the two weeks, you can turn it back into us and we will get you an awesome Four Springfield shirt. The care card has been sent out in the mail and you can also download it from our website, wesleymethodist.com or from any of our social media pages. Tune in to our social media accounts to see how the staff and other Wesley family members are serving the community. And don't forget to tag us in your posts by using the hashtag for Springfield. We also ask that if you like what we're doing each week, make sure to share our worship services and other posts with others. We also want to invite you to share your prayer requests with us in the comments or through direct messaging or on our website. You can also share your tithes and gifts through our website or by mailing them into the church. This morning, we are going to hear a sermon from Pastor Chad titled, Crossing the Line. So let us come together and worship. Hi, I'm Dan, and I've been asked to lead prayer this morning. Join with me if you would. Almighty, all-knowing, all-loving God, we gather together in this 21st century way with the same spirit of Christ that was promised to be with us even from the very first days of the church. And that spirit binds us together. Even though we are social distancing, we are close in your spirit. We pause, Lord, to give you thanks for your great gifts and your goodness, your loving kindness that you have shown on us all of our lives. We especially, Lord, thank you for the great gift, the great loving kindness that you have shown in giving us your son, Jesus. For Lord, he came from heaven to step onto our broken, sinful scene as one of us to show us the nature of God, the loving kindness that lives in his heart to redeem us from the evil in which we live. And Lord, we give you thanks. We pray, Lord, as we are gathered now together, that we will hear once again the words of Christ, that he has come to seek and to save all the lost, that he came because you, Father, loved the whole world, we pray, Lord, that you will take us back as little children when we used to sing that little children's ditty, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. We confess, Lord, that as we have matured and grown up, that we have lost that song. We have not only failed to sing it, Lord, we have in some ways lost the meaning and the message. We pray. Lord, that in these moments you will remind us once again that it is not us versus them, it is not they versus we, it is all of us, Lord, who stand beneath your cross in need of your help, in need of your loving kindness and goodness and grace once again. And those who stand next to us, Lord, though we may not know them or understand them, Lord, they too are loved by you. They too are in need of your grace. For Lord, we all, we all are fallen. We pray this day as we watch the news on television, as we read the reports, that you will once again, by your Holy Spirit, encourage us to sing the song as little children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And may we once again be united in your love and your grace. For it is in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us that we ask it. Amen. 
Please sing with me hymn number 547, O Church of God United. O Church of God United, to serve one common Lord, proclaim to all one message with hearts in scripture lesson today is taken from the 10th chapter of Acts and selected verses. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion in the Italian company. He and his whole household were pious, Gentile God worshipers. He gave generously to those in need among the Jewish people and prayed to God constantly. One day at nearly three o'clock in the afternoon, he clearly saw an angel from God in a vision. The angel came to him and said, Cornelius. Startled, he stared at the angel and replied, What is it, Lord? The angel said, Your prayers and your compassionate acts are like a memorial offering to God. Send messengers to Joppa at once and summon a certain Simon, the one known as Peter. At noon on the following day, as their journey brought them close to the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted to eat. While others were preparing the meal, he had a visionary experience. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large linen sheet being lowered to the earth by its four corners. Inside the sheet were all kinds of four-legged animals, reptiles, and wild birds. A voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Peter exclaimed, Absolutely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke a second time. Never consider unclean what God has made pure. While Peter was brooding over the vision, the spirit interrupted him. Look, three people are looking for you. Go downstairs. Don't ask questions. Just go with them because I have sent them. So Peter went downstairs and told them, I'm the one you are looking for. Why have you come? They replied, We've come on behalf of Cornelius, a centurion and righteous man, a God worshiper who is well respected by all Jewish people. A holy angel directed him to summon you to his house and to hear what you have to say. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in order to honor him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Get up! Like you, I'm just a human. As they continued to talk, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, 
you all realize that it is forbidden for a Jew to associate or visit with outsiders. However, God has shown me that I should never call a person impure or unclean. For this reason, when you sent for me, I came without objection. Peter said, I really am learning that God doesn't show partiality to one group of people over another. Rather, in every nation, whoever worships him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is the message of peace he sent to the Israelites by proclaiming the good news through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I've been seeing a lot of things online and on TV that if I'm honest, that they overwhelm me. I don't know if you can relate, but it seems like every day we're faced with new obstacles and new struggles. I think when we look back on the first six months of the year 2020, we'll be hard pressed to comprehend everything that has occurred. I don't know about you, but to me, it feels like the world is pretty broken right now. And it feels like it's a divided place these days. Now, don't get me wrong. There's been a lot of good that I've seen as well. There have been countless stories of helpers, those that are uniting in these uncharted and uncertain times. And it was a nice sight to see that our local community was featured as an example of doing it the right way in regards to some of the peaceful protesting last weekend. But unfortunately for me, those scenes of positivity don't do much to outweigh the negativity that I see on my screens. Now, luckily for me, I have the Super Bowl on my DVR, so anytime the, the news overwhelms me, I can just fast forward to the third quarter and watch Patrick Mahomes uh, lead us to victory. But I also found some positivity online this week when I saw this picture again. I'm not sure if you've seen it before or if you know its context, but let me point out to you its significance. This is Mr. Fred Rogers and Mr. Francois Clemens. And Francois became one of the first African Americans with a recurring role on a kids TV program in 1968 when he took the role as Officer Clemens on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In over 30 years, Officer Clemens appeared in 98 episodes of Mr. Rogers. And make no mistake, the choosing of his role as a police officer was not by accident. It was a direct response to the culture of community and police relations at that time. This image comes from May 9th, 1969, in an episode where Officer Clemens soaks his feet in a wading pool with Mr. Rogers. And in our modern context, that might not be as significant as it was at the time. You see, public swimming pools were desegregated in the 1950s, which only led to more separation. Private pools were formed, country club pools became a normal, and for Mr. Rogers to share his private pool with Francois would have made quite a statement in 1969. Now through this and countless other examples of the Presbyterian minister, Fred Rogers, showing his faith, letting God's love flow from him, he made an incredible impact. Francois went on to become a famous opera singer, and he noted this relationship, this mentorship from Fred Rogers shaped his life. And the viewers that, that watched Mr. Rogers' program got a front row seat to authentic faith and love lived out in the form of intentional actions. Simply put, Mr. Rogers was not afraid to cross the line when it came to his faith. Mr. Rogers wasn't going to hold back at showing his love. And to me, that, that has a lot to do with the gospel. Because I believe that the gospel is bigger than difference. I believe that Jesus is able to transcend any line or, or any gap that stands between us. I believe that no matter what causes the separation, the love of Jesus is bigger than it. Because of the gospel, differences don't need to be divisive. And lines don't need to limit love. Think about that. Differences don't need to be divisive. And lines don't need to limit our love because the gospel of Jesus is built upon the ultimate line crossing. When God pursued humanity through Jesus, he's crossed the line. He brought his love and his grace and his mercy in physical form, and that bridged the gap that our separation from him creates. That's based on love. And that love is on full display 
in our morning scripture from Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we have two primary characters. We see Peter and Cornelius. Now we're familiar with Peter. He's been our focus over the Fragile Stone worship series. We've seen Peter over the past few weeks at Lowe's, and we've seen Peter at Highs. And last week we saw Peter walk on water with Pastor Mike. We've dug deep into the idea that God used a fragile man in Peter to become the cornerstone that his church would be built on. Cornelius, however, though, is probably a less familiar character in this story for us. We learn a lot about him in just the first two verses of chapter 10. He's introduced to us as a Roman centurion who lives in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was a large town about 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It was named after Caesar Augustus, and it was the capital of the Roman province in Judea. It has military headquarters and countless leaders of the Roman Empire. And Jewish people actually had a special name for Caesarea, and their name translates roughly to a place of ungodliness. They were not fans of the people that lived there. And as a resident of Caesarea, Cornelius would have rubbed soldiers with Roman elite. As a centurion in the Italian regiment, Cornelius would have been the backbone of the Roman legion. And he would have been responsible for enforcing discipline over the 100 soldiers that he led. His position came with respect, authority, and he was well compensated. His salary would have been roughly five times greater than that of an ordinary enlisted officer. He played a key role in this story. It's important, though, that we understand that Cornelius was a Gentile person of wealth and power living in a Roman-occupied city in Judea, which in many ways should have made him the enemy of Peter and the Christians. However, we also learn in verse 2 that Cornelius has a heart for God, and he prays to Yahweh, the Hebrew God, instead of praying to the gods of the Roman Parthenon. He even used his faith to promote his generous giving to those that were in need. As we continue to read through chapter 10 of Acts, we read about a vision that Cornelius has one day when he's praying. He's visited by an angel, a heavenly messenger from God, and he tells him that Cornelius' pursuit of God has been noticed, and that he was to go and, and have a meeting with Simon Peter, and that would show that God's pursuit of Cornelius was just as authentic as Cornelius' pursuit. And, and this wonderful vision tells Cornelius that, that this is to happen soon. So immediately after the vision, he gets three of his staff and says, go to Joppa and see Simon Peter and bring him back to me, just as the messenger told me to. At that same time, we read about Peter having a remarkable vision. It was about lunchtime on a day as just so happens Cornelius' party is about to reach Joppa. And instead of helping with lunch, Peter goes up on the roof to pray. Peter's probably hungry, maybe even perhaps hangry. I'm sure you know somebody like that. So he's praying to God. And in this prayer comes a vision. And the vision is a sheet being lowered down to the earth from heaven. And it's kind of an odd image because within that sheet, there are creatures, four-legged creatures, reptiles, and birds, which was a strange sight for Peter in this heavenly vision. But it gets a little odder because the heavenly messenger in Peter's dream gives him a command. It says, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. Now, if you know Pastor Mike very well, you can realize that I picked this scripture and not him because his response to this angel's request was probably going to be similar to Peter's. Peter says, hard pass, no way. He's bewildered, but he tells the angel that he can't. He's lived his life following the Jewish dietary customs. He's been told what he can and what he cannot eat. And many of the things that he saw in that vision were on the list of things that he cannot eat. There was a line drawn and those things crossed the line for Peter. And so Peter explains to the angel, no matter how hungry I am in this moment, I'm not willing to cross that line because Peter was afraid of becoming unclean. And becoming unclean in, in Jewish culture that Peter would have known all about, in a lot of ways, draws a line. And it makes you unworthy to practice in the temple. Now the heavenly voice responds to Peter, never consider unclean what God has made pure. And because Peter is big on doing things three times, this, this interaction between Peter and the angel happens twice more, which makes the main point of the heavenly message pretty clear. I think this is a lot more about Peter's heart than about his diet. 
God isn't trying to change Peter's diet. He's trying to change Peter's heart. You see, I believe that God is preparing Peter to think beyond his own context when it comes to following Jesus. And God is using this as an opportunity for Peter to consider the Jewish traditions that he follows become lines and barriers when it comes to spreading the gospel of Jesus to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles. You see, Peter is overwhelmed, which makes sense because these lines are deep-rooted in Jewish tradition. Peter was raised knowing these rules, and his understanding of how to connect with God is based on following these rules, right? And this is how the Jewish people lived as God's chosen people. It's an important time in Christian history. This marks a moment when important questions for Jewish followers of Jesus are being asked. Questions like, what Jewish traditions will remain intact for followers of Christ? And more importantly, can the gospel of Jesus cross the line from Jew to Gentile? Is the message of Jesus applicable to people who are not Jewish? While Peter is still struggling to fathom this interaction, the Spirit closes their conversation by telling Peter that he has house guests, that Cornelius' messengers have arrived. Peter meets them at the door and the men explain who they are and who Cornelius is, which is important for us to understand because representatives of a Roman centurion should not be welcome into a Jewish house. But Peter follows the advice of the Spirit and invites them in. And a huge taboo for Jewish culture to have non-Jewish people, Gentiles, enter into your home. We can assume that Eaton and the Bible tells us that the representatives from Cornelius stay the night. And the next day they begin their journey to see Cornelius in Caesarea. And almost the entirety of this interaction between Peter and Cornelius' representatives would have crossed cultural, societal, and religious lines. There had been long established and observed, but this interaction that Peter is willing to have with these people crosses those lines. To associate with, to eat with, to travel with, to stay with, that would have been remarkable for Peter to do. It's clear that he's following exactly what the Spirit told him to do. He is not considering unclean what God has made pure. Now, after some travel, the group arrives in Caesarea. And Cornelius greets them with a large party that he had gathered in preparation. And as soon as he sees Peter, he throws himself at Peter's feet. And Peter picks Cornelius up and explains that he's a fragile man. There's no need for Cornelius to weep at his feet. And after Peter acknowledges the fact that the interaction that they have is, is crossing these lines and is, is looked down upon by other Jews, he asks Cornelius why he sent for him. And Cornelius explains that this messenger from God told him that Peter had the answers. Now here's what's interesting. I think it's important for us to understand. Why would God want to involve Peter at this point? There's a heavenly messenger in the face of Cornelius, has his attention. Why can't that heavenly messenger just lay out the gospel? Why would God want to involve Peter? I think we can answer that question in terms of width and depth. You see, God wanted to expand his kingdom wider and not just geographically, a wider audience of people to people looked as less than or as enemies of the Hebrew people. God wanted Cornelius to know that he was pursuing him just as Cornelius was pursuing God through his ultimate pursuit of Jesus. God wanted his kingdom to become wider. God also wanted the gospel to be spread deeper. He wanted to make sure that Peter understood that differences don't need to be divisive and that lines don't limit God's love. And God wanted his rock to have firsthand experience that God's pursuit through Jesus is for everyone. And here's the good news. Peter and Cornelius both got the message. In verse 34, Peter says, I really am learning that God doesn't show partiality to one group of people over another. Then Peter goes on to preach and he lays out the story of Jesus' birth, his life, his miracles, his preaching, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. And everyone that's listening to Peter preach is awe-inspired. And the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And they're baptized. And they invite Peter to stay there in Caesarea for several days. <clears throat> At the end of which Peter even is still astonished that the Holy Spirit would be poured out for these Gentiles. Think about it though. If Cornelius had been satisfied with the comforts of his current life. If he pushed aside his pursuit of God when it came time to cross the line. Or what about Peter? 
If Peter had let the differences, the lines that he saw drawn, he would have slammed the door in Cornelius' messenger's face. But God uses this interaction to have huge impact in Christian tradition. If we can see above the separation that the barriers and the lines of the world create, we can realize that the gospel of Jesus is wider and deeper than we can even imagine. Now, our context, I understand, is far different than Peter and Cornelius. We're not faced with the major questions of whether or not the gospel is available to non-Jewish believers. And thanks be to God for the vast majority of us that would fall into that Gentile category. Instead, the questions that are at the center of our faith are pretty hard for us to comprehend. Questions like, how far are we willing to let the gospel go? And how deep and how wide are we prepared for the gospel to spread? Which ultimately leads to some iteration of the thought. Bear with me. Am I willing to spread the gospel to people that are different from me? People that I might not agree with? Here's what I want to ask you this morning. What lines are you willing to cross for your faith? Now the exchange between Peter and Cornelius beautifully illustrates willingness to cross lines when it comes to their faith. It's fueled by the same love that Fred Rogers showed in his program when he interacts and embraces Francois Clemens, crossing those cultural lines. The world around us is going to draw countless lines of division. And those lines are in many ways made very clear. In our nation, the past few months has seen the vast expanse of our separation from God and from each other. And that chasm has been on full display. And unfortunately, we probably won't get much of a break from the chaos as we continue to navigate cultural instability, COVID-19 impacts, and with elections in November getting closer every day. But how could we change our perspective today? How could we look beyond the lines of division? What can we learn from Fred Rogers and Francois Clemens? What can we learn from the story of Peter and Cornelius? What if we looked at the story of Peter and Cornelius, two should-be polar opposites, two men whose society would label as supposed enemies, but instead they leveraged their faith and they found that what they had in common through God was a lot bigger than the lines that separated them. What if we took that as our inspiration? If we did that, we'd find out that the gospel means that differences don't need to be divisive. And lines shouldn't limit God's love because the gospel of Jesus is built upon the ultimate line crossing, God coming to humanity in human form of Jesus. And because of that ultimate gift, those lines shouldn't separate us anymore. Hear this, the gospel is bigger than our differences. Jesus is able to transcend any line or difference that's drawn between us. No matter what factor or standpoint becomes the source of division, It pales in comparison to the enormity of God's love. The love of God is bigger than all of the lines that we could draw. Are we willing to cross those lines? Are we willing to let God's love push us beyond what society and culture and the world wants to hold us to? Are we willing to let our lives be proof of God's love? Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Out of the depths we cry to you, O God. In our suffering and our pain, we reach out to the one who is the healer and the comforter. O Lord, we hear you crying out to us, asking us to repent, to return to you with our whole hearts, to admit our sin and to accept forgiveness. So we pray, O Lord, that you would hear our hearts, that you would mend them, and those that are torn apart by unkindness, that you would bring healing. We pray for the healing of our souls, wasting away from the despair around us. We seek your forgiveness for the sin that we have allowed to persist. We pray for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. Grant us, O Lord, a vision of your world as your love would have it, a world where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor, a world where the riches of creation are shared and everyone can enjoy them, 
a world where, where different races and cultures live in harmony and mutual respect, a world where there is healing and a camaraderie to defeat disease and to protect our neighbors and to love on our communities, a world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. Give us the inspiration and courage to build it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for all that you have poured out upon us, for meeting our needs, for hearing our prayers, for guiding us in the path that you would have us take. And so we join together in the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
seems like we're always building walls. We always seem to be getting in the way of the work that you're doing, the work that you're doing in us and around us. We're building walls in our hearts. And those things are rooted in things that are not from you. They're rooted in selfishness and pride. God, I pray that in all things that we do and all things that we think about, that they will be holy and that they will be from you and for you. Lord, I pray you'll do a new thing in our hearts this week and you will bring us together in unity the way that you created us to be. Thank you for all that you do and we're confident that you're going to do it again and again. We love you. Amen. Friends, thanks so much for joining us for worship. We are so blessed that you were able to come together with us to lift up in praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, you're going to want to be paying attention for the next few weeks because we've got a lot of exciting things happening. So starting next week and then for two weeks, we are going to be having not only a series called For Springfield, but we're going to be asking you to actually join us in doing ministry for Springfield. So pay attention to that. This is going to be an awesome opportunity for every single one of us to make a true difference in our community and to lift up the name of Jesus and to let our light shine. So you're going to want to be a part of this. Now, I'm sure all of you by now have gotten the wonderful news that uh, tentatively we are planning to uh, open for live worship on July the 12th. Now, already since we started talking about this, um, the, the picture has changed. And so I'm going to ask you to do us a favor is do extra diligent work in keeping up with what we're sending out, whether it's an email or whether it's a PSA, whether it's our Facebook, because this a situation is so fluid and it changes so rapidly that we literally um, kind of have to just react to things the best that we can. So for you to be able to be completely aware of everything that's going on, we really need you to, to an, do an extra good job of paying attention to everything um, that we are sending to you. So we're excited. July the 12th, we will be able to be together again. But again, remember, it's going to look very, very different. So we're going to send you instructions on how do you sign up for worship and what is that going to look like and what you can expect. So good news is, though, it's a giant step in the right direction of us being able to be back together again. And we can't wait for that. So take care, friends, and pay attention because we're very excited about everything that's taking place. God bless. Bye now.